Can a defendant's prior bad acts be brought out against them in the course of their trial? To find out, you have to read People versus Weinstein, but it's 77 pages. Don't have time for that? I've got you covered. This is TLDR, Too Long Didn't Read, where I cover New York Court of Appeals cases, and I try to do it in five minutes or less. This is the episode on the case of People versus Weinstein. The citation for this case is 2024, New York Slip Opinion 02222. Published by the New York Court of Appeals on April 25th of 2024. The issue in this case is under what circumstances a defendant's prior bad acts can be used either in a prosecution's case in chief against them or on cross-examination of the defendant uh, in, a, in a Sandoval uh, application. I'll explain the background of that in just a moment. Uh, to appreciate the context of this case, you have to first understand what a Sandoval and Molino ruling is. Uh, basically, a Molino is a is a hearing, a pretrial hearing, where the prosecution is required to go to the judge and get an advance ruling about what kinds of prior bad acts, uh, including convictions, can be used in their case in chief to prove the defendant's guilt on when it's, when it's, when it's the people's burden. Um, and they have to bring this to the judge, let the defendant have a chance to rebut it. And the basis of it is basically it can't be for propensity. It's got to be for some other relevant ground. And the basic general um, exceptions to the prohibition of using prior bad acts uh, on a defendant are mimic. We call it mimic. M-I-M-I-C. It's a, it's a mnemonic. Mimic is motive, intent, mistake, identity, or common plan or scheme. Um, and the judge has to engage in a two-step process. The first step to identify the non-propensity reason why you're why the pre, why the prosecution is seeking to admit that evidence, and the second is a balancing of of the probative value versus the prejudicial effect to see if it's fair uh, to do it. The second uh, thing that's helpful to understand is the Sandoval hearing. Sandoval is a different kind of hearing. It's a it's a it's a pre-trial hearing where the defendant is entitled to have an advance ruling on whether and what kind of information the people intend to use on cross-examination of the defendant. So a defendant has a right to testify on his own behalf, but if the prosecution intends to cross-examine the defendant about certain prior bad acts or criminal convictions or criminal offenses or non-charged offenses, the, the defendant should know what those things are going to be to decide to make a reasoned decision whether to testify or not. And that's the same kind of thing. Basically, it can't be, it's got to be relevant to to credibility. So the prosecution is not allowed to just elicit the fact that the defendant's a bad person uh, and has a propensity to commit crime. It has to be relevant to credibility as to whether the defendant is going to be honest or following the, the rules uh, of the oath. And if the defendant is going to place his own interest above that of society, uh, then the prosecution is allowed to bring out information like that. So if a defendant has a previous perjury conviction, that would be, uh, or a previous crime of theft, those are classic instances where these bad acts can be cross-examined uh, of the defendant to elicit the fact that he might not, being, not, might not be being honest when he's testifying. What are the facts in this case? The facts are that the defendant in this case is Harvey Weinstein, who's a famous um, super producer in Hollywood, a famous movie producer. He's produced movies like Lord of the Rings trilogy, Good Will Hunting, Django Unchained, things like that. Uh, the prosecution, and, and over decades, he's been a movie producer for decades. The prosecution alleges in this case that there was a well-known secret in Hollywood that movie stars would have to exchange sexual favors with producers like Harvey Weinstein uh, for parts in movies. Prosecution, prosecution claimed in this case that he used his power to take advantage of young female actors to coerce them into unwanted sexual encounters. And when they resisted, he would uh, use force against them uh, to compel forcible rape or forcible sexual interactions. There are three specific complainants in this case. They call them in the decision complainant A, complainant B, and complainant C. Complainant A, what's alleged in this case is complainant A, uh, there was forcible oral sex on in July of 2006. Complainant B involves forcible intercourse and oral sex uh, in March of 2013. And complainant C involves interactions in 1993 or 1994. Before trial, there was a Molino and Sandoval hearing where the prosecution sought permission to uh, in the Molino, bring bring evidence out about the defendant, prior bad acts, and there was a variety of things that the prosecution sought to elicit, um, including uh, they wanted to cross examine, they wanted to bring out on their on their case in chief, uncharged sexual assaults against complainant B, uh, before and after the charged offenses, as well as threatening behavior, and they also wanted to literally call three Molino witnesses, witnesses 
were not charged, but witnesses who could testify about the defendant's misconduct towards them years before and after the charged offenses to show the defendant's intent when he had the interactions he had with the complainant A, B, and C. They also had a Sandoval uh, hearing where the prosecution said, I want to be able to cross-examine the defendant about, and they, and they brought out a list, a long, a laundry list of things. I have a list in front of me of 17 things that they wanted to cross-examine the defendant about, things including whether the defendant directed a witness to lie to the defendant's wife, whether the defendant filed a passport, uh, filed an application for a passport using a friend's social security number, whether the defendant told a woman he could harm her professionally, but could also offer her a book publishing deal, whether he used his budget for personal costs, but also things like whether he physically punched his brother in, in the face during a business meeting, whether he uh, scheduled a business meeting under false pretense in 2012, whether he threw a table of food, whether he threw a stapler at somebody, um, whether he screamed and cursed at a hotel restaurant worker after they told him the kitchen was closed. So they had this whole Sandoval hearing and many, many more. Uh, and the judge allowed certain things and disallowed other things. Particularly, the judge allowed the three Molina witnesses to testify. Uh, the people called their case. They called the three Molina witnesses. They also called an expert on rape trauma syndrome to explain uh, issues of why the complainants in sexual assault cases may continue to have uh, relationships, both consensual and platonic, um, with sexual offenders. Uh, the defendant did not testify. The defendant did not testify. That's important. And in February of 2020, the defendant was found guilty of rape and criminal sexual act, but not guilty of being a sexual predator. He was sentenced to 23 years in jail and five years post-release supervision. He then appealed his conviction saying, these Molino and Sandoval rulings were error. They deprived me of a fair trial. They kept me off the off the witness stand because I couldn't testify on my own in my own behalf because I was afraid of being cross examined by all the things the judge was going to let them cross examine me about. The appellate division affirmed what the trial judge had done. They said that the testimony shows that the that the, the testimony was important, it was relevant, the Molino evidence was relevant, and they affirmed the Sandoval ruling as well. They said the defendant the the allegations show the defendant would place his own interest above that of society and would be indicative of his credibility. The appeals to the Court of Appeals, and here's the holding. They reverse. They reverse the conviction. Why? They say that we've gone too far afield with respect to Molino and Sandoval. They say with respect to the two-step process of Molino, step one being, is there a non-propensity purpose? Not just merely that the defendant's a bad guy or a criminal or has a propensity to commit a crime. They say it fails. All the Molino fail. These Molino witnesses fail at step one. They say it's not relevant these other witnesses, these other interactions he had are not relevant to show his intent or his uh, interactions with the complainants A, B, and C. They say that basically what's the, what the, the, the interactions here had with the complainants A, B, and C are clear enough on their face with respect to intent, which is the reason why the judge let them in in the first place, that you don't need uh, other witnesses to elucidate that, and they wouldn't elucidate that. The defendant's interactions with other people don't show his intent with respect to complaints A, B, and C. They say, go back to the original Molino ruling. It's, they say it should be rare that prior bad acts are brought out on the defendant's case. He should be tried for the crimes he committed, not the non-crimes that he did in the past, not bad acts that he's done. So they say it fails at step one. And for that reason, the Molino was error and a constitutional violation. But with respect to Sandoval, they say that also is error. Why? They say... Several of the things were not relevant to his credibility. Not all of them, but several of them. Specifically, the parts that were improperly allowed in were that the defendant verbally abused an employee, that he threw food at another worker, that he bullied and verbally abused his personal assistant, that he pulled out of business deals, that he threw staplers at people, that he punched his brother, that he threatened executives, that he photoshopped the head of an actress onto the nude body of another person without consent. These specific things that the judge allowed at the trial court, this court of appeal says error. Too much, not relevant to credibility. And the Court of Appeals basically uh, says, go back to basics. Go back to Molino. Go back to Sandoval. It should, only be, it should only be rarely allowed in and only when it's specifically relevant to credibility of the defendant who testifies. These are loathsome, appalling, shameful, and repulsive conduct, but they destroy his character and make it more likely to be convicted even if he's not guilty of the crimes for which he's charged. That's the holding. I will note there are two very strongly worded dissents by Judge Canatero and Judge Singus, and they say this has gone too far. Uh, we are we are leaving sexual assault victims out in the cold by these rulings. Um, but the holding here is that 
Molino and Sandoval should be strictly construed and strictly applied. Uh, and that's the case of People versus Weinstein. Have a good day. If you like what you just saw and want to see more just like it, please hit like or subscribe to let me know. 